Welcome everyone. In this video I will continue the discussion of the last lecture where I was talking about the lenses. And uh, since we have the lenses and uh, we discussed the optics of the electrons then we can continue with the optical aberrations. So what kind of uh, defects can uh, occur on your images when you are uh, using an electron microscope? So there are uh, basically four or three main uh, defects or aberrations and uh, those are of course closely related to the structure of the microscope and also related to the uh, working principles of the microscope. So let's just uh, discuss these uh, four different things and see how they work. So the first one is the spherical aberration. Uh, that is basically when you have your uh, lenses here, or one lens, uh, this uh, vertical line. Now this illustrates a lens. So if you have your uh, source here, it's a point, then you have uh, different rays from that because of course your beam is not just a single point but it's uh, basically a beam so it has some uh, scattering or distribution so it goes through different different parts of the lens so different parts of the magnetic field created by the electromagnetic coils and then the further you go from the optical axis which is this uh, horizontal line so the further you go in this direction uh, the more the beam gets deflected. So if you follow, for example, the OA uh, point, then uh, the A goes uh, closer to the uh, axis of the lens. And then if you are closer to the optical axis uh, with the OB uh, ray, then that goes uh, further away from the lenses. So if uh, we say that this is the uh, plane, the image plane, so where your picture is uh, projected at or something like that, so where your uh, beam should be focused, then you see that uh, uh, the original beam should go like O, A, Y and uh, that, that should be uh, the beam without any aberrations but since uh, there is an aberration uh, in the lens, uh, the spherical aberration, then instead of O, A, Y, uh, this part of the beam goes O, A and X, so it ends up here. And uh, therefore you will have uh, some part uh, of the electrons uh, focused here and another part uh, is here. And uh, of course if you are between these two points, then uh, those will be focused basically between these two points. So what uh, this will cause is that uh, if you look at the plane uh, from, from the top, so basically from, from this direction, then instead of having a point, then there will be a so-called uh, disk of confusion. So your point, which is basically this point from the source, uh, will be more like, yes, uh, a disk. And then of course that has a certain diameter and that diameter can be calculated by using the spherical aberration coefficient of your uh, lens or microscope and also it also depends on the divergence angle at the plane formed between A and Y so basically you take the angle of this uh, line here so this line and the optical axis closes an angle like this. So this should be the divergence angle formed between A and Y. And then uh, we should think about how to solve this uh, problem. Well, uh, one of the most simple uh, solution is to exclude the uh, parts of the ray uh, or the parts of the beam which are so far away from the optical axis and how we do that of course we just put an aperture there so basically we put an aperture here and then we keep those parts of the beam which are closer to the optical axis so those rays uh, will uh, 
uh, create a smaller circle here. And then also if you change the working distance, so basically uh, you have the end of the uh, pole piece and then you have your uh, specimen. So let's say this is your specimen here sitting on a stub. So basically if you change this distance, uh, this is the working distance. So if you decrease it, so you move your uh, specimen further towards the uh, pole piece, uh, then uh, that can also uh, decrease this uh, spherical aberration. Uh, the problem with the aperture, uh, maybe you already remember uh, that from the previous lecture, is that if you uh, decrease the size of the hole, so uh, you increase the aperture, or you decrease the diameter of the aperture, then uh, of course you also decrease the current and uh, the probe current is very important. So you have to compromise between the spherical aberration and the probe current. Then the next uh, type of aberration which we can talk about is the chromatic aberration. Uh, similarly to the previous one, uh, this also appears in uh, traditional uh, optics. So if you have a camera, uh, then uh, you can meet these kind of optical errors as well. So it's uh, again a very nice uh, relationship uh, between the optical and the electron optical, uh, or light optical and electron optical uh, phenomena. So here again we have a point source and we just uh, follow one ray of the beam now. Uh, we go here with a certain uh, part of the ray and then uh, we notice that some part of the ray uh, will end up uh, here let's say in front of the focal plane or image plane so this is again the plane and some part uh, will end up perfectly at the uh, plane. Why? Because uh, when you have your source, so let's say this is uh, here is the source of course, then uh, the electron beam is not monochromatic. What that means is that uh, when you produce the electrons in the gun, you won't produce a single uh, energy, but you will uh, produce a distribution of energy when you create the electron beam. And with that uh, the different energies will be bent in a different uh, way when they cross the lens. So when they cross the magnetic field, uh, different energies will uh, bend to a different degrees and therefore they will end up uh, somewhere e even uh, not only in front of the, la uh, front of the plane but also they can go behind the plane. And then similarly uh, to the spherical aberration that we just discussed, this also creates a disk of confusion. And uh, that also depends on a chromatic aberration coefficient, that is something typical to your um, system, and also the divergence angle uh, at the plane formed between A and Y. So again, like similarly to the previous uh, case uh, up here with the spherical aberration, then also we have this uh, alpha angle and uh, that is what uh, determining or that is what determines this uh, diameter. So again we have our plane, we look at that from the top let's say and instead of having just a single spot uh, as the uh, probe size or spot size then uh, we have a bit larger uh, size. But uh, still you don't have to imagine this as a huge visible spot at least with nowadays microscopes. I don't know uh, I don't know this for older microscopes but those which I'm working with uh, do not produce these kind of big visible spots but uh, still you can notice from measurements and uh, high resolution imaging that uh, something is wrong and of course that's uh, basically the superposition of these several uh, aberrations. And then uh, I think we arrived to one of the most important uh, part that is the astigmatism. Uh, that's again 
something which exists for uh, light optical uh, systems as well. But here, what is the most important thing is that uh, when you create your microscope, so you put together, you assemble your lenses, you wind your coils and so on and so on, uh, you can never reach perfectly symmetrical uh, structures and therefore you cannot uh, achieve perfectly symmetrical uh, magnetic fields. Therefore the beam will not go to a homogeneous or uniform uh, magnetic field so it will be sort of stretched uh, in a certain direction so if you think about the plane that is caused by the electron beam, then it will be stretched in x and y direction. And uh, this can be, uh, let's say, easily corrected by having a so-called stigmator. So in this picture here, this is uh, the final uh, piece of the lens. And in that you have a so-called octopole, which is basically like a magnet, uh, which consists of like eight uh, poles as its name suggests and uh, with that you can uh, finally uh, change the magnetic field uh, in the area of the stigmator and that can like stretch and squeeze the beam in such a way that uh, you can actually correct these uh, small uh, inhomogeneities in the beam caused by the lenses about this Part and maybe also within this part. So at the end uh, where you have your specimen, so for example here, uh, you will have a more or less perfectly circular spot. So that's how astigmatism is corrected by using uh, stigmators and uh, that th th those are basically active components. So when you think about, uh, for example, the uh, chromatic aberration and the spherical aberration, uh, those are uh, the aperture in that case uh, is more like a passive component. Of course, you can change it, but uh, once you changed it from one value to another, uh, let's say from 60 micrometers to 120, these are typical aperture values for a certain microscope, then uh, that's all. But here, uh, for the astigmatism, uh, you can change the x and y values, and uh, then it's basically an active mm, modification of your uh, beam. So it's not only just putting some objects uh, here and there, but uh, you create a magnetic field which actively uh, changes your uh, beam. And uh, it can be a bit pain in the butt that uh, whenever you change some uh, things with your uh, conditions, for example you change the probe current or you significantly change the magnification, increase it, or uh, you have some different uh, specimens, then you always have to check uh, the uh, astigmatism and correct it. It's not a big deal, it can be done, uh, let's say, maximum in a minute but uh, sometimes you can have some challenging uh, conditions and uh, it's very difficult to find uh, the proper values to set it up. And uh, something is not really mentioned here, but uh, still can cause uh, similar problems than astigmatism, is that uh, you have to align your apertures as well. So for example, uh, you have your beam and that, uh, let's say, is, is crossing some kind of hole, then it continues, of course, down here. But it can happen that the beam does not cross the hole uh, perfectly in the middle. And if it is not crossing uh, perfectly the middle of the hole, then that can also lead to astigmatism. So therefore, there is another uh, thing that you can and you have to do when you uh, set up your electron microscope for measurement is that uh, the aperture alignment and what you can do is basically uh, let's say that this hole is in in a plane 
and uh, adjust for making things easier. One diagonal is, let's say, the x direction, and the other di diagonal, since they are perpendicular to each other, that's the y direction. So you just basically align your aperture in the x and y direction uh, by moving the uh, the beam or the aperture, and uh, with this uh, you can get rid of uh, this part of the astigmatism. In fact, you start with this. Uh, after focusing the image, you will see that uh, the image is still not perfect. So it's focused, but uh, still you can see the optical errors. And uh, usually these two things are uh, not directly controlled by you, but the astigmatism needs the interaction uh, with the user. So first of all, you align the aperture and uh, that can be done in simple cases electronically but uh, sometimes you have to do this mechanically by turning uh, the knobs on the electron column and that, that's basically just moving this uh, aperture back and forth on the x and y axis and uh, trying to find the, the middle of the aperture. Uh, so you do that and how this is done is that uh, the microscope wobbles the beam, which means that uh, it moves, let's say this is the focal point, uh, it moves the focal point uh, back and forth. And uh, when it moves uh, it back, back and forth, so uh, just let's put this here, what you see on the screen is that uh, you have your screen and you have uh, some spot and if your aperture is misaligned, then uh, your spot is moving either in this direction or in that direction or diagonally, so the superposition of these two uh, directions basically. So what you have to do is that uh, you start to move uh, your aperture in these two directions and uh, try to make this spot move out from the uh, plane of this plane. So the movement uh, should not be either x or y directions, but it should be z direction only. And then that means that uh, you manage to uh, align your aperture in a way that the beam crosses it in, in the middle. So you align your aperture, we are very happy, but we still see that this uh, spot is, let's say it's a bit elliptical in this direction. And then you go to this guy here, uh, the stigmator, and uh, the stigmator uh, we'll also need the x and y values. So you change the magnetic field here, you correct those uh, tiny imperfections of the beam by changing the, uh, yeah, basically the magnetic field in the stigmator, and that will uh, lead to a nice and focused pictures. Uh, I will try to show you this part from a real uh, procedure because uh, it's very spectacular when you see that you start from a not focused and not corrected image and you reach a very nice and uh, sharp image. So uh, this was the astigmatism and then uh, finally we can talk about the diffraction. Uh, that's basically just caused by the aperture. Uh, here we have the lens or no, here we have the aperture and then this thing also happens for light optical uh, systems. So if you have a microscope or if you have a camera, then uh, if you change the aperture towards a larger number, which means that uh, let's say you have f2, then uh, you have a large aperture, but then when you have f11, then you have a small aperture. So if you go towards this, uh, you increase the image quality because you start to like, yeah, you go in this direction with the aperture. So you chop off these parts of the uh, rays, both for photons and both for electrons. And that's good because you want to keep those beams which are uh, very close to the optical axis. So uh, until a certain point you don't have uh, this problem with the aperture but when you start to uh, 
match the size of the aperture with the wavelengths of your beam, which is either can be a beam of photons, like for your camera, or it can be a beam of electrons, like for our electron microscope. And then if you start to uh, go down uh, with this diameter, then you start to uh, notice uh, diffraction. And then that also causes a disk of confusion. So basically in the middle, uh, which is now it's here, uh, there will be a disk of confusion with a certain diameter. And that diameter basically depends on the energy of your beam. Uh, so basically, indirectly, uh, depends on the acceleration voltage and of course this convergence uh, angle as usual so that that is basically the size of the aperture and then uh, for this uh, the only solution is to not use a very small aperture and I think usually you don't really use very very small apertures uh, except you need something uh, really high resolution images or something like that but uh, usually you can go large enough apertures uh, to neglect the diffraction so I I have never really experienced this part uh, of the of the optical aberrations however I always meet uh, the stigmatism so yes so we discussed four different kind of uh, optical errors, which were the uh, spherical aberrations, uh, chromatic aberration, astigmatism, and uh, diffraction. And uh, we also discussed how to uh, get rid of these. Nowadays, uh, the optical systems of the microscopes are very, very advanced, so the user don't really have to give too big input or too large input so it's uh, very very uh, easy to correct these uh, optical errors or optical aberrations but maybe in the old times it was more uh, difficult because most of the things were not computerized and of course the precision of uh, different parts was uh, a bit less so yeah, there were different things, but uh, nowadays uh, we can say that uh, most of the microscopes can get rid of these errors quite easily. So yes, this was all about the optical errors. So I hope you learned something and I hope that this was useful to you or informative. And in the next video I'm going to talk about some different types of uh, lenses just to see what kind of systems are used uh, nowadays and uh, how they tackle different problems. So see you in the next video.